when I think of her contributions, I think one was she she opened up the diverse the diversity of the Neolithic religious imagery, the multiplicity of the goddesses that were there, not just a mother goddess, not just an earth goddess, but the dozens of different divinities, female divinities that presided over different aspects of life in the Neolithic, whether it was weaving or hunting or childbirthing or the agricultural, the horticultural uh, activities of the society. All of this is represented symbolically in their art, and this is what she deciphered. It's absolutely one of the great decipherment efforts in, of human spiritual understanding that has happened in the centuries. They've found many models of sanctuaries. The models, these are the beautiful things in some of the, is the, that the artists made replicas of their religious sanctuaries with little miniature figurines and miniature vases, you know, miniature artifacts in them. And so they, even though the full sanctuary itself hasn't survived, the model has survived. So, I mean, they're like, this is just one of hundreds of examples of how you know this is religious art. And another thing we know just in general about prehistoric art is frequently the most abstract markings are used to represent the deity because the deity, of course, is so abstract. <laughs> the very concept is abstract. So geometric markings uh, frequently encode, a can encode a theology, basically. Pe people don't realize that one of her major discoveries, as I see it as a scholar of religion, is laying out the different male deities that existed at this period of time as well. So that's very important, what you call the sorrowful god, uh, the horned god, there's like a Dionysus figure, there's an early Dionysus, an early Zeus, an early Hermes. She found the Neolithic strata for a lot of these figures, which we can recognize in Greek mythology, the male deities. Human beings have been making their mark for at least, probably with the Acheulean, at least with the Acheulean uh, st stone tool industry that's associated with Homo erectus and Homo ergaster in Africa and around the rest of the world, spreading out of Africa. From the earliest of those tools is 1.4 million years old. So this tradition of, and there are markings, clear markings by 800,000 years ago. So the marking tradition of geometric signs begins around 800,000 years ago, perhaps earlier. The oldest piece of evidence we have is 800,000 years ago, uh, and, and, and later evidence at 500,000, and then subsequently. So we know that people were making marks, specific marks which appear to have an intentional meaning. Because I couldn't, wouldn't have been able to make it back there, with, to get my mind back there to understand some of this without her decipherment and decoding of the Neolithic symbols. Because this is the earliest language decoding that we have available to us to understand our evolution. So we have to go with Maria's work and then look at the Paleolithic. And yes, there are diff there are some of the signs are different in the Upper Paleolithic in the Ice Age art of Europe, but some are the same. Those people who don't like the goddess tradition, it will be hard for me to raise this point for them, but this goddess tradition is probably as old as human evolution, probably three million years old. And if you don't like the term goddess because it comes out of classical Greek culture as a term or whatever, that's okay. But what this represents as part of our spiritual tradition of who we are, it is millions of years old. And we're in the process of decoding it. And I'm not the only one. There are dozens of people out there working on this. <laughs> we didn't have any minds before Homo sapiens sapiens. You know, our ancestors before that didn't have any language, didn't have any art. You know, um, 
but how was it they made boats at 500,000 years ago and sailed to the island, you know, to the Southeast Asian islands? How is it they had beautifully, beautiful pen, pentagonal hut floors, perfect pentagons, symmetrical pentagon point posts for their hut floors in Japan 500,000 years ago that they discovered a few years ago? And now we know, of course, well, they, have, they were making figurines. So from Barakat Ram in Israel, we have a late Acheulean figurine, female figurine, looking very much like those later Upper Paleolithic Villendorf figurines. The marking tradition, which tells us the language is certainly there, is at 800,000 years ago. They were expressing a spiritual religious worldview at this period of time. And it was their relation to nature and, um, and to their community was represented by these signs. And I'm, one of my tasks is to try and decode the meaning of these symbols and what they were saying at that time and what they have to say to us. Because all these four strata are in our psychic life. We have these deep strata. And the deeper we go into ourselves, psychologically and spiritually, the deeper we go, we descend into each of these strata further and further back. And we carry that in our psyches. And we need to understand it because it's going to help us, again, get to where we're going in the future and carry us into the future. We have this now accepted, I guess, as the earliest artwork that we know of. And, and who is it? It's, it's a female figurine. And it's part of this, if you call it a goddess tradition, you can. You call it a tradition of female figurines that have a symbolic importance to a people. Let's, we can call it that. And so that's accepted now by the archaeological establishment. Part of our psyche, and, and it's all there. So we have it within ourselves to be able to, if we look at the data, not project into it, but look at the data, we, we'll, we can look for the patterns that are in the data itself, in the signs themselves, you know, how the signs are combined, how the signs are placed against pictorial images in the same register, so to speak. So the sign means what the image means. That's how you get a decipherment. That's how Maria did it. That's how Egyptian hieroglyphics were deciphered by Champollion. That's how Maria deciphered this language of the Neolithic, of old Europe, of the goddess. And in the same way, I'm trying to work on the Paleolithic to decipher those signs when they're placed against other, in combinations with each other, which we know they are. They're paired up. Signs are matched with signs. They create a syntax. There's a syntax. This is completely accepted by the establishment of archaeology, that there's a syntax to those signs and that, and that art. And the task is to decipher it. And I'm confident that we will. You have to be there because the landscape is part of the sanctuary. The earth is the sanctuary. You have to be in the landscape and that's where you experience the power of the site. The same way to experience a, a medieval cathedral, you can look at a picture in a book, but when you're inside it and feel the verticality and the expanse, that's one thing. The same for these this sanctuary at 45,000 years ago. And so this energy, this tradition then is moving down through the Upper Paleolithic and into the Neolithic. And then on the Neolithic goddesses, is, it's the same. The one who gives birth, this is the site of the one who gives birth, who is, who can, this is a continuation of this Acheulean tradition comes down through the Middle Paleolithic. This idea of the one who gives birth, this is represented in the graphic signs of the Acheulean tradition. It's part of the symbolism of the hand axe. It's the symbolism of the female figurines. This birthing process of giving birth and being born, which of course we have as a basis of many of our religious traditions today, right? So here's where it begins. Here's some of its origins in the Acheulean at 500,000 years ago, into the Middle Paleolithic, and then into the Upper Paleolithic. And this site is a wonderful example of this. 
is an awesome, awesome sight. And I wish Maria could have seen this sight. She would have loved it. Let's put it this way. When I spoke, I spoke about the diaspora yes. out of Africa. These four diasporas went through the bottleneck of the, of the Sinai Peninsula. All of human evolution went through there. So in that area, like there are sites which carry these diaspora in them. There are, in my understanding, of the archaeological findings of the last couple decades, okay, there are four major diasporas out of Africa, the same geographic area. Why not? Why wouldn't some signs continue down into the same geographic area? These are their descendants. You know, some people have come in from in diffusion waves of emigration, but the original people are still there. They're building a joint kind of hybrid Neolithic society, which has hunter-gatherer activities and horticultural going on together in the same communities. That's typical. Hunter-gatherers and horticulture. Horticulturalists have do hunting. <laughs> you know, that's typical. Of, <laughs> so it's a combined society. So there's some process there. Is it, so there's a desperate need in our psyche today to get in touch with us. So it may be Maria's work. Some archaeologists can't understand it or don't want to read it, or there's some tiny part of it that maybe it needs to be updated, you know. So they reject the whole thing or whatever. Um, whatever their problems are with it, it doesn't matter because our psyches are demanding that we go back and learn about this that we acknowledge our ancestors, not deny their existence, not erase them from the textbook. You know, there is there is there is a European, old European culture autonomous from Egypt and uh, Sumeria, should be part of our textbooks. There's a Neolithic civilization, not just in Europe, but China and Africa and so forth, should be part of all our textbooks. There is rock art of hunter-gatherer peoples 50,000 years ago in which the same symbolic traditions are being shared all over the world. We should know about that. It might be useful to us, you know, to know about our roots, about our ancestors. They had to go through some difficult times. They had to go through a bottleneck. There's a currently a th one of the hot theories in archaeology right now and uh, of the origins of the Homo sapiens sapiens says Homo sapiens sapiens went through, quote, a bottleneck. Maybe only a thousand people survived, whatever the cataclysm was, whether it was a volcanic global thing or whatever. We were all descended from a very small clan, basically, of Homo sapiens sapiens. So there's a bottleneck. And now we're going through a similar cataclysm of extinction of species, of threats to the global sustaining, the sustaining capacity of the earth to, to feed us, we're going through the bottleneck. And so we should look to see what other people thought and understood and learned when they went through the bottleneck. You know, we're going through the next phase of evolution. So there, there's guidance, you know, that we can get. There's a record of going through it once before. We can read the record. We can maybe learn something that will be useful to us. And what's wonderful is Alexander Marshak, the archaeologist, who is a, one of the great specialists on the Paleolithic of Europe, has wonderful num a series of essays on decoding some of the graphic signs. And he happened to work with the sign having the meander zigzag signs, in totally independent of Maria, and came up with the same decipherment. So we know that that sign, which had to do with flow or water, continued down into the Neolithic in the same geographic area. And why not? Why wouldn't some signs continue down into the same geographic area? These are their descendants. 
he would say this is at 50,000 years ago, there was a common tradition of symboling across the planet. So if we are now moving into a global planetary society, we need to know what was our original planetary language. And rock art is that language. It should be taught in every university. It's taught now in not a single university in the United States, and not, I don't think, anywhere in the world. Is there, you can take a semester in rock art. It's part of who we are. It's part of the deep strata of our psyche. You know? It's part of our living tradition. I want to deny that it exists. Some people want to just deny that it even exists, you know, or call it speculative. It's our living tradition. <laughs> it's, it's in us all the time, you know, and the artists are articulating it now. They've gone to this next level down because, because their traditional forms can't carry, can't hold. You know, the artists are leading us and they're going deeper and they're spontaneously generating the Paleolithic imagery, the Neolithic imagery, the geometric signs, the most important contribution she has made to my work, my effort to, is, is her decoding of those signs that she discovered a language that, in a sense, you could then, anyone knowing the signs and the, and the decoding, could speak Neolithic. You, know, you can speak Neolithic. It's not, there's not the case that it's a, it's had an oral language, we don't know the language, so we'll never know what they had to say. No, they have a system of geometric markings. They even have probably a written language, we just don't have enough archaeological material to have the texts to work with. There is, she, and Maria has a section on the linear scripts and stuff, but we don't know how to decipher that. But the geometric language that she deciphered. And the deciphering to me is overwhelmingly convincing due to the mass of data, the coherence, the logic, the pattern, the structure of the associations that are in the material that she has detected. 